Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to this uh, edition of uh, the Spring Seminars. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having uh, Jeffrey Compier with us. Uh, he was an expert in uh, asymptotic uh, uh, symmetries and uh, and so on. So he, we are today going to hear about uh, the BMS group in ADS and DS. Uh, so over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you, thank you a lot, uh, Siddharth. So thanks a lot for the invitation to be here. My pleasure. Um, so uh, please uh, interrupt me for questions. I cannot see you, but just um, turn on your your mic and maybe your video, and I will uh, I will answer with pleasure every, any question you might have. Uh, so um, so this talk is based on the three papers that I did with uh, two students, with Adrien Ferrucci and Romain Rosiconi, both in Brussels. Um, the, the, the first one is mostly on uh, flat space, uh, assembly flat space time, but then the two are on assembly ADS spaces. This is what I'm going to talk about today. But first I will review a bit uh, the picture of what is BMS. Um, so you, you, you have heard that there is um, this progress in the infrared uh, structure of assembly flat gravity, uh, mainly led by the, the group of Strominger. Um, and so let me just review this in a, in a minute. So um, in the leading infrared um, uh, triangle, uh, you have a super translation uh, transformation uh, and super translation charge. Um, and super translation is really a, a asymptotic symmetry of asymptotic flat space times at non infinity. Um, so, and it's a neutral charge in the sense that yeah, there, there is a constant charge Z to it, which is called dimension two charge, so a surface charge. Um, and if you uh, integrate this charge over the entire null infinity and over the entire past null infinity, actually these two uh, total charges are related uh, because they are boundary conditions at special infinity. And then if you quantize the, the quality of these two uh, total charge at the entire null infinity, you get a wild identity. And that wild identity is nothing else than the leading soft graviton theorem. Um, and these um, super transitions, they're just diffeomorphisms. Uh, but in fact, uh, they relate uh, two different uh, space times, uh, so two different, uh, uh, well, we can just take maybe just two Minkowski space times. And if there was a shock wave or any, anything happening in between these two Minkowski space times, uh, it can have the effect of inducing a change, uh, having a non trivial boundary condition between the past and the future uh, Minkowski that differ by a super translation. And so this is a, a null radiation induced super transition jump. That's how I would like to call it. Uh, and one effect of this is that uh, ob some observers will have uh, some displacement, finite displacement in their geodesic motion. And it's called the, the displacement memory effect. And displacement memory effect is really a step function in the, um, the way um, you know, two, two observers get uh, finitely shifted. Uh, and the step function is fully transformed is a, is a pole and the pole is, uh, appears in this leading subgraviton theorem. So in a sense, there was a Fourier transform between these two. So at subleading order, that is more complicated. It's not a triangle um, anymore, but what appears as symmetries are super Lorentz transformations. They're also called super rotations, but I prefer super Lorentz because they are super uh, rotations and super boosts that are qualitatively different. Um, and you also have wild identities, which are subleading subgraviton theorem, but this time you have different type of memories according to if you look at the transformation or if you look at the Fourier transform of this quantity. And at subleading orders, you also have the same kind of structure. Um, so if we want, we can, we can ask me questions about this, it's just, um, just to show you the overall picture in flat space. Uh, so I don't know if you know um, the basic definition, so let me just give what is a super translation. Um, so this is the form of the generator. Uh, if you have uh, an arbitrary function on the, on the sphere, um, so times the, 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 the vector along the retarded time direction, which is the direction along uh, scribe. Uh, so and then it gets some, some extra correction depending on the gauge in which you are, but that's basically what it is, it's a super translation. So there's no the charge associated with the bonding mass aspect. And the lowest harmonics are the translations and associated to momenta. So all that structure was described in 62. The super Lorentz transformations, um, so it's mostly two arbitrary functions on the sphere times uh, the, so the, the, the vector tangent to the sphere at infinity. 
with some sort of correction that depend on the gauge in which you are. Uh, and there are neutral charges at the bond the angular momentum aspect, uh, also called NA. And six special uh, transformations are there. The, the lowest harmonics, if you decompose these functions in lowest uh, harmonics, L equal one, so you have six of them. And those are the Lorentz uh, charges associated to angular momenta center of mass. So Lorentz are asymptotic symmetry standard, but the, the, the others are Overleading transformations that change the boundary metric, and they are more spe special. They've been looked at uh, by Barnish and Trussard uh, around 10 years ago. Okay, so just to say that there is a, also um, an interesting flavor um, to this uh, for the observations. The, the displacement memory has not yet been observed, but uh, there is a, a serious uh, possibility that it, it could be observed by LIGO uh, by um, combining. Um, signals. So, uh, so if you want, I can I can tell you about this too. But basically, if you have uh, waves being detected by LIGO, uh, there is a finite displacement uh, due to the displacement memory. But since the I mean the, the detector is really attached, you pass through uh, some uh, response function of, of the detector. And if you look at the response function, what happens is that you really have a small signal, like two percent of the signal to noise ratio, so too small to be detected. Um, but if you accumulate like 100 or 200 different signals and put them, put the signal together, so it's called coherent mode stacking, you will be able to, to see the effect. Uh, so that's what I've been describing these papers. The other memory effects like the spin memory and kind of things are very subleading. There's no real prospect for now. So do you have questions about this general introduction before I, I, I go towards the more precisely into the- Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Uh, it was uh, about two slides uh, before this. So you you talked about overleading um, factors. So what are they about? Where they do they come from? Yes. So uh, so usually we you define asymptotically fast space times uh, by saying that um, a, a such a space time is Minkowski plus a perturbation, which is like one over R in some large radius uh, expansion. But in fact, uh, if you act with these vector fields, like if you take the linear derivative of this vector, you will see that you will change the, the met Minkowski metric at leading order. So the, the boundary um, sphere, which is rounded, uh, will get deformed by the deformorphism. So in that sense, they are uh, over leading transformation in the sense that they, they are not decaying like one over R. They are like leading, like uh, changing on the boundary uh, sphere at infinity. So this so, is why traditionally they uh, were discussed. But so, what is what is the reason uh, for considering these transformations? Uh, so when we the, the reason is that they are interesting because they are associated to, to non-trivial neutral charges, which is the bond angular momentum aspect. So this bond angular momentum aspect, to to obtain all the charges associated to them, you would need an arbitrary function of all the sphere and integral over the, over the uh, over the sphere to get to extract all the charges. If you only looked at Lorentz charges. Uh, you only had the, the lowest L equal one harmonic of this function. So there's much more information in that that, um, that 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 function than that. So it's interesting to look at this uh, all, all these these um, transformations because they also the wide identity is the subleading subgraviton theorem. So you have at least two reasons to to look at this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a similar question? Yes. Uh, so like, uh, I think uh, you know that there is a tension between for, whether this RA is uh, D phase two or is it uh, Vira Soro generator. So when we extend from the global part to the local part, basically from the low range to the whole thing. So can you make comment about that? Yeah, so, so there are two uh, different um, extensions of the Lorentz group uh, to, to the super uh, Lorentz transformations. So here I will look uh, at the D phase two uh, so where these functions are smooth and arbitrary function of um, of the coordinates, the angle coordinates. So you can choose theta phi or you can choose stereographic coordinates, z z bar. Um, but uh, there is another um, way to extend Lorentz, which is by two copies of the Virazero, where you have only functions of z and function of z bar. Um, I find that uh, extension uh, less interesting. Um, for this, the two purposes I, I mentioned here, because the bond angular momentum aspect is really an arbitrary function of the, the, the two angles. So it's not a meromorphic anti-meromorphic uh, function. 
and also for the subleading self gravitan theorem, so the, the proof by Campiglia, Lada, uh, and others uh, required uh, to have a non um, holomorphic function to be able to prove the equivalence between super Lorentz charge and the subleading self gravitan theorem. Uh, so, but from the uh, symmetry point of view, are you not expecting that, uh, like, uh, if you extend from low range to something else, RA, so your asymptotically Minkowski space time is going to be changed to something else because you just mentioned that the sphere, round sphere, goes to something else. So yeah, your so asymptotically you, um, space time is not Minkowski but something else? Yeah, it will still be Minkowski. It will be Minkowski in a weird coordinate system. But, but uh, also, so I think, like, if you consider a D phase to probably the U H U U component also the leading component will also change, so yes. that that will not be minus one but some order one quantity. So, That's like right. this, this is telling that it's not kind of just by coordinate redefinition you cannot go to Minkowski something else, like even uh, asymptotically. So so here for flat space I will look only at boundary condition in which, uh, you know at at the future of future infinity and the past of past infinity you are in Minkowski. But in Minkowski, that can be in a, in, in a weird coordinate system, like in this large diffeomorphism corresponding to these DFS2 generators. So indeed, for this uh, Minkowski in these weird coordinates, the, the GUU component is, is uh, minus the, uh, the Ricci scalar divided by two of the, of the boundary metric. And the boundary metric is an arbitrary function on the sphere. Uh, but it's not U dependent, it's uh, U independent, because these functions, these, these, radia, these re RA functions are just function of the the, the angles and that's function of u. So I'm not going to consider an arbitrary function of, of, of u for the... Okay, okay. So basically the statement is then, then at u going to plus infinity and minus infinity, one will get asymptotically flat, but in general you, at, on a null infinity, it may not be asymptotic Minkowski. Yeah, so I, it will be um, asymptotically Minkowski, but in a generalized sense, in the sense that it can be, uh, these large diffeomorphisms will be allowed to act. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is what I, I will obtain from the limit of ADS, actually, is the DFS2 group. So it's the BMS in the sense of DFS2, but that will be also obtained from the, this construction of uh, reducing from ADS later on. Um, so le le let me give the, 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 the main, um, uh, well, main original motivation of this talk, uh, of this work. So, uh, you know, in ADS, we, we know very well uh, when you have Dirichlet boundary conditions, uh, we can have two copies of the Virazo algebra or in terms of group of the diff S S1 group. Um, uh, and that was obtained by Brown Hano uh, in the in 80, 86. And then if you reduce, um, when you, you look at the, the flat limit, um, you can see that you have an algebra, actually the generator gets mixed a bit between the two and you get a diff S1. So this is, is, a, is a combination really of these two. And, and then a set of vector fields that, uh, well, trans all, all commuting vectors, which are super translations in uh, three dimensions. And this for the BMS3 group. So in, 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 in uh, four dimensions, we have this DFS2 and then the super translation, which form a semi-direct structure. So the, the question was, is there a structure in ADS4 that reduces in the flat limits to this BMS4? So that's the, the question I will address here. So to, uh, to understand that this is possible, uh, we have to see that the this BMS structure can be really uh, implemented in all cosmological constants. So here is a, a Penrose diagram of flat space where you have foliations by uh, null hypersurfaces, which are, are fixed with the time. And also uh, each point is a sphere and we fix a specific measure. So the, 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 the two sphere will have a specific measure, specific determinant. In fact, uh, you can also do that in ADS uh, and in, in the sitter. You can define a foliation uh, and a measure of the boundary sphere. And uh, you know, in ADS or in the sitter, you have a, a boundary metric. And that boundary metric, so you can fix it uh, to be uh, given by this form. So the, the, the sign of the cosmological constant will give you, if, it's, if this u is time-like, null, or space-like, uh, and then you have a, a boundary sphere here. So that, that's the structure that will be universal and will allow to map um, the different cases. So to understand a bit that map, we need to uh, also um, translate uh, the, the asymptotic expansion. So here, uh, one expands the metric in terms of the Bondi expansion, 
um, so the bond expansion contains the shear, the bond mass aspect, the bond angular moment aspect, and various fields are still being ordered in the, the two sphere. So actually, there's an infinite number of them um, in flat space. So, uh, and in the ADS, we are familiar with the Pfeffer Gram expansion, uh, where all the fields are just the boundary metric and the stress tensor. Uh, if you analytically continue, actually, you find the same structure in the sitter, and it was derived actually earlier by Starobinsky, uh, and it's the boundary metric and stress tensor as well. So a bit more precisely, the Starobinsky Pfeffer Gram gauge is given by these conditions. So there's a row coordinate, a radial coordinate, and you fix the the G row component and uh, some other coordinates that are um, orthogonal to it. And then the bondy gauge, where you have a, a, a radial foliation uh, as well. Uh, and this time uh, it's a luminosity distance. You fix the GR equals zero, uh, GR A, where A are the component of the sphere. And then you fix this condition, which just tells that um, up to the leading order, the determinant of the metric is fixed. So, uh, and the idea is that R is a, it from, comes from astrophysics, so that R is a luminosity distance in the sense that it's the radius of the two sphere. But you can exchange that for uh, another condition if you don't like that one. Uh, it's called Newman Unti gauge, and you have G R U equals minus one. Everything I say will be exchangeable between the two gauges. So the good news is that the um, dictionary between this Bondi gauge and the Starobinsky Pfeffer Gram gauge has been worked out in four dimensions. So you can solve the large radius expansion of Einstein's equations in both gauges. Um, and when the cosmological constant is zero, uh, you can find a diffeomorphism between the two gauges. Um, and that diffeomorphism then allows you to also map the free fields in each gauge. So work like this has been also by another group, but our map is too covariant. Um, are there questions on, on this? Uh, sorry, one question, Jeffrey. Yes. Uh, if so, so when you say you solve the Einstein's equations in the large radius expansion, uh, do you assume that the metric has some analytic, uh, uh, you know, analytic expression in terms of R's, like you have some? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Exactly. I will. I will explain that in a minute. So actually, what's the next slide? So let me answer your question with that slide. Um, so the. Um, in the in the Starobinsky Pfeffer Gram gauge, we have the Pfeffer Gram theorem. So we know that the most general solution, uh, asymptotically uh, to a, a asymptotically locally ADS spacetimes, is given by this form with some expansion, which is polynomial in uh, the radius row. And uh, G1 is zero actually. G2 is a Ricci scalar, uh, Ricci um, tensor of G0. And G3 is independent fields, it's, and it's up to a normalization constant, it's what is called usually the stress energy tensor. And all the subleading components are totally fixed in terms of these two free data. So, and then we have a, a strong theorem that shows that this is the most general expansion. In bonding gauge, you start with a generic, uh, generic decomposition uh, with arbitrary fields, V, beta, uh, and uh, shifts, UA, and the arbitrary metric on the sphere, GAB. And then you need to, to, to write down expansion for these quantities. So here is an expansion, and uh, we chose it to be polynomial, but then at some point we need logs as well. And you can, you can actually see a posteriori, since there is a map between the two fields, that because of Pfeffer and Gram theorem, this expansion, when lambda is different than zero, is also the most general one. In flat space, we don't have such a theorem. That actually is an open question. It seems that polynomial is sufficient for a purely retarded boundary conditions. So it's a conjecture by Blanchet and Damour of the 80s. Um, but there is no general proof. Mm -hmm. But but uh, so you but there's a proof when lambda is non-zero, right? Yeah, when and, lambda and is zero, then this would be the most general expansion because it's there was a map to the Pfeffer Gram gauge where we know this is the most general expansion. Right. Right. Okay. Thanks. So um, then, so the map between the three fields is the following, when the, 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 there's a cosmological constant, the, there is a boundary metric on the Starobinsky Feldman Gram gauge. And in bondy gauge, um, so we have this decomposition because we have to distinguish U and, uh, and the angles, uh, but there is a you know, beta zero, QAB and shift. So you can just equate these two boundary metrics. That's the dictionary. And on, um, we also have the stress energy tensor. And actually there is a way to build it, but it's non-trivial. 
So you have first to decompose it into like a U component and A component. Then you take the trace three parts away from the, all these components, and all these have an expression. And this is the bonding mass aspect, the bonding angular momentum aspect, and it gets correction, which are non-trivial, and then you can repackage them into the stress energy tensor. So note that there is a, a funny constraint in ADS, uh, a nonlinear constraint like this, this one. So it just says that the, the, the boundary metric has a specific evolution along U. But in flat space, when lambda is zero, um, it also tells you that the, the shear CAB is not constrained at all. It's totally arbitrary. Here, the, the shear is, is a function of the boundary metric. They are related in, a, in ADS or the C3. So now, the, as you know, the, in, in uh, Feffman gram gauge, you have the trace condition and diversion condition on, on the stress energy tensor. And if you decompose this way, uh, it means that you have evolution equation, the U of, of this bonding mass, uh, corrected bonding mass aspect and corrected angular momentum aspect. And this evolution equation is especially useful when you introduce these variables, especially, uh, sorry, simple when you introduce these variables. So maybe at this point you might ask, okay, why, why is the bonding mass aspect and angular momentum aspect not the one appearing in the stress energy tensor? Why is there a shift? Why is the origin of the shift? Maybe that's, so that's something I was a bit puzzled about. But um, sorry, yeah. Jeffrey, just one minute. Uh, this L is the ADS radius. What is the L? Sorry, what is the? What is L? This ah, one? Uh, sorry, yeah, L was defined here. Uh, L is the, the trace using the boundary metric uh -huh. of LAB, L -A well, it's basically uh, this quantity. So it's a, a U derivative of the, of the LN of the de determinant of, of uh, yes. So um, I will always impose here as a boundary condition that uh, the determinant of, uh, of this determinant is fixed to be U independent. Uh, but in, in generality, we derive the equation for when they can be U dependent. But if, if this is uh, U independent, the L is zero. It's a uh, technicality. Uh, so, so, sorry, Jeffrey, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm getting a little uh, uh, confused, but, in, in, but I just, uh, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, I can hear you, uh, yeah, not very well, but yes. Yeah, Speak sorry, the question is, uh, so far, this is just a, a different slicing. If I just look at the left-hand side, a different slicing of ADS. I mean, it's like, yes. instead of doing, I could do, a, I mean, instead of a Poincaré or global slicing, it's just a different slicing, is it? Is, it, is, it, is there anything more that's been done or is it? No, 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 no. Here I, I'm going a bit slow. I'm a bit slow. I'm just want to show you uh, introducing the notation at the same time. But at this point, there was nothing really uh, more than just uh, changing variables. So it's a change okay. of variables. Because, okay. and, and, but, but this is, a, you know, it, somehow this is the, the boring part, the annoying part, because to be able to take a flat limit, uh, you know, so if you take, if you take uh, Fifth and Gram and you take a flat limit, uh, you, you know, Feffman gram gauge uh, does not admit a flat limit. So, so you need to first uh, work a bit on your, your fields here in ADS to be able to take a flat limit. And to understand how you generalize, you know, BMS to, to, flat, to, to ADS, you, you need to, to, to work out this dictionary. Otherwise, um, you just cannot do it. You, have to, you need to have a dictionary, uh, sorry, to, you need to have variables that admit a flat limit in ADS. Okay. That, that, that's the point. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, but it's it's not uh, it's the it's only algebraic. I mean, it's a lot of computations, and I thank a, a lot Adrien and Romain for that. It's a, it was a very long and painful computation to work on this. But um, so uh, I just Sorry, mentioned. Can, yes. Can I also ask? So in the previous slide, so can you explain a bit? Uh, maybe why do we have these constraints between the bondy fields? Ah, so uh, yes, yeah, so these are evolution equations. So when you solve Einstein's equations, you will find, um, and you solve it for cosmological constant different than zero, you will find that uh, everything is determined uh, algebraically, uh, and then also associating orders, uh, except two uh, non-trivial uh, first order constraints. And they come from the fact that you have different morphism invariants, you know, you have, uh, you know, you, you have these uh, first order uh, constraints. They really come from the, the fact that sorry CGR so so what variant. you call constraints here are coming from Einstein's equations yeah uh, yes yes so ah, they so, but, equations so 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 do they still exist for example if you forget about the ADS uh, limit and so on just consider the asymptotically flat spaces yes. so do they so still it, exist 
Yes, yeah, yeah. So it's the oh, same. Okay. These, these, these equations are valid for lambda zero or non zero. Okay. Yeah. When the difference when lambda is, uh, is uh, zero is that the subleading fields now are, are also this kind of equation, lambda d equals something. And so they are um, now sub subleading fields are not constrained anymore. Um, there are um, more fields in flat space than in ADS which is something that I don't fully understand, but it, this is related to the, the choice of boundary conditions at past uh, near infinity as well. But here, everything is algebraic. I solve only at future near infinity, and those constraints are, are true for any value of the cosmological constant. And you see, the, the, it, the, it's a re, just a repackaging, and these constraints are just exactly the same as these ones, if you write it in a different dictionary. OK. Um, so the so I'm a bit um, behind schedule, but it's very good that you ask question. Please continue. Uh, so just to mention here, the you know there was a lot happening between these two boundaries. Uh, so if you look, if you look at a small region, and this is really what happened in a minute, uh, when your radius is very small compared to the to the scale of the cosmological constant, uh, it has some uh, non-infinity. Uh, that we will absolutely at, have in the limits when uh, lambda goes to exactly to zero. Uh, but you should expect that the, the, the dictionary between bonding mass and, and, and what you mean by energy here and here is different simply because these space times are, these boundaries are in different places. So, so this shift is natural because it's not the same, you're not talking about the same boundary really. Okay. So, uh, so I already mentioned this. Uh, in flat space, you cannot solve anything in the Van Graan gauge; it does not exist. But uh, in Monde gauge, you have these free fields and then some subleading free fields because they are not constrained anymore. But all the rest is it's identical. Okay. So let me come come now to the to the most important definition. So, what is the lambda BMS group? So, um, since you have a boundary metric you can uh, boundary gauge fix. So you can now fix um, this, um, uh, so, uh, so I call it um, sometimes U or sometimes T. Uh, sorry, maybe you will get confused about this, but so T is U is the same. Uh, so, it's a, so in ADS, it's a, it's a time co coordinates, it's a, a, long, a long ADS. Uh, so the, I fix the, the, the time component or the U component of this boundary metric uh, and then no mixed component and I fix the determinant of it to be fixed. So, so that the boundary metric takes this form. So this is a boundary gauge fixing. It can always be reached using a, a diffeomorphism, at least locally. So it's not a constraint on the Cauchy problem because you can always reach it. So in particular for the sitter, in the, the sitter case, you know, you impose this, um, this, these conditions at the future boundary of the sitter and you will not constrain your Cauchy problem because it's a, using a diffeomorphism, you can, you can reach it. And now the, the, the residual diffeomorphisms of, after you, you, you fix this, is, is, um, uh, it forms the lambda, the lambda BMS group. So once you fix, for example, the gram gauge and then this boundary gauge fixing, uh, then the residual symmetries are what I call lambda BMS. So uh, to work them out, it's very easy. Uh, you go back to, 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 to your favorite review of uh, in Pfeffer and Graham gauge. So you look at, uh, you know, what is the group of different, of different fields that preserve Pfeffer and Graham gauge. So, uh, roughly one yes. question at this point. Yes, hello Amitabh. Yeah, hello. <laughs> So the transmissions required to go to this gauge, the boundary gauge fixing, uh, you, don't, you don't consider these to be part of your asymptotic symmetries? Yeah, so here uh, I'm taking like the reuse phase space approach in the sense that I, I, I try to fix things. Um, so I'm, 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 uh, I'm doing a, a large, if you want a large diffeomorphism to reach this, um, this gauge, this boundary gauge, and there I will define my asymptotic symmetry group, my fields, and so on. I will assume I am in that gauge. Do you so, agree that the, the full bonding class of metrics will have a bigger symmetry than um, So, so uh, well, he, here, I mean, if I, if I don't fix this, uh, then I have the, in, in a Pfeffer and Graham gauge, you know, so you have all the DFS3 and then the Vi transformations. 
So that's the, you know, the, the group of symmetries of uh, the Pfeffer and Gram gauge. But for me, it's, it's too large. You know? um, so it, it does not allow to, to take a flat limit and to understand uh, what's going on. So, so, so the idea is to do this boundary gauge fixing um, to reduce it. And then uh, one, it's not possible to reduce it further in any easy way because uh, without constraining the Cauchy problem, because you cannot um, un untangle the residual diffeomorphism from what is actually uh, varying, which is the boundary metric here of the two sphere, which, is, which will be varying. So okay, I'm not sure. That, yeah, so, I, so that's the, 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 the philosophy here. Um, so I don't want to constrain the Cauchy problem, but I want to find the structure that generalizes BMS. And, and that's the, the way to do it. Um, so, so, sorry, one more, one more naive question, just yes. uh, reflecting my own, my own uh, uh, lack of understanding, I think. But I'm getting a little confused about the de-sitter versus the anti-de-sitter case. So ah. mm -hmm. uh, when you go to uh, anti-de-sitter, I can see there's some constraints uh, which would you know, relate uh, the evolution. Just um, you take one, the zero, zero component of the Einstein's equations. Uh, yes. But in de-sitter, I'm getting a little confused because when you go to late times, you should have effectively an unconstrained uh, uh, you know, three metric on the very late time surface. Yes. I'm confused yes, so about what these bondy gauge constraints are telling you there. Ah, yeah. So the bondy gauge constraint here. So the boundary metric is totally free. So this, this G, G0, uh, which you can rewrite in components here. So it's totally free in, uh, in all cases. Um, the, the, what is constrained is this subleading component, the stretch energy tensor. Uh, and here, you is for the sitter, it would be a space-like type. Um, so, but is, there, there is an equation like this. So it's a it's a constraint on the uh, on the stretch energy tensor, um, which is this one, huh? the transition of this one in a uh, gram gauge. So it's, there's no constraint on G zero indeed, uh, and 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 a priori it should be it should remain non-trivial because uh, there are you know gravitational wave going all the way to infinity and a priori the peer in G zero as well. I see. Okay. Good. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so you start with this arbitrary uh, Pfeffer gamma type gauge. Um, so you, this is the group of diffeomorphism. But now I, I fix the, um, the, the determinant of the two sphere, and that will actually uh, kill the Weyl transformations, which are here, this W that generates this Weyl. Now you fix uh, the TT component or UU component, uh, and then that will impose a, a condition on the generators. So on the U component, the, the evolution of this U component is fixed. And now you fix the, the last step, the, you, you remove this G U U U A. Um, and then you get a constraint, an equation on uh, the evolution of um, the angular part. So the angular part is fixed, D U F Y A is fixed. And L again is this uh, D U of L N of the determinant. So these are the two, the only two constraints you have. So, the flat limit of this, when lambda is zero, uh, you see there is a good flat limit. So this goes to zero. You can solve this equation by saying that Ya is a, just a function of the, the angles. And then you can plug it here. You can uh, consider um, the boundary metric to be U independent as a boundary condition. And then you integrate this and it's simple, it's linear in U. And these are the, the typical uh, uh, function that appear for the BMS group. So now you can work out so the algebra. So, uh, so the vector uh, is really so a function of u, y, a, and then some subleading component. What really matters is the, this leading. Um, so if you would do the, the Lie bracket between them and you compute what is the resulting uh, vector field, you will see uh, it takes the same, same form. And uh, the y just give y themselves. Uh, two uh, f's give you a y. And then you have this, non, this uh, semi-simple uh, structure here, f and y. So now note there is a QAB here. So when lambda is zero, uh, these are the structure constant of the BMS group of the, in the sense DFS2 and super translations. When lambda is non-zero, now you have a QAB here. And QAB is the field that appears that is arbitrary and it's a function of u, it's a function of the sphere. And it's totally arbitrary. So this structure constant depends of the fields. So uh, in the literature, so uh, if you look at the supersymmetry literature, supergravity, like the book of Van Proyen, you will see that there was examples of this is called soft algebras, when you have field dependence in the, in the structure constant. Uh, but in the, the mathematics literature, it's called an algebraoid. So you can choose your name. Um, and so in the, in the flat limit, it's field independent. 
Um, so that's that's the flat limit. Uh, this is um, for the, the record. Huh? So it's the standard uh, BMS. So you see the structure uh, is generalized as Poincaré. Uh, but I said already all this in the introduction. Okay, so this is for the, the symmetries. So let me now talk about a bit about the dynamics. Um, except if you have a question more about the, the schematics aspect. Okay, let me move on. So now... Um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, I have a question. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, I'm a little, uh, maybe you're, you're going to address this as you go on, but the question is, um, what is the uh, interpretation of this uh, generalized algebra in EDSCFT? Ah. I mean, how do I understand these isomorphisms yeah. and what is this algebra yeah. in the CFT? Uh, yeah, yeah, so I will... Um, yeah, I can, maybe I can answer, let me answer this in a, after talking to something structure. I will, I will explain that. Because uh, I, 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 better, I better introduce, so, but the basic answer is that uh, there is a, this is, there's no CFT anymore. There is a CFT, but it's coupled to a, a, it's inside of a metric that is fluctuating. So it's useful for uh, ADS coupled to a different exterior system. Uh, and it should be a symmetry group for an ADS coupled to an external system. Yeah, so let me come to this. Uh, but first I need to introduce some elements of dynamics here. Um, so, uh, the, so the standard action now for, uh, for ADS is the, the action with the counterterms of Bayer-Bras, and Krauss and the standard uh, counterterm action. Uh, and if you look at the, the first dynamical quantity is a, is a symplectic structure. It tells you about the fluxes uh, leaking out of your boundary. And you build it this way, so you vary your Lagrangian and change your Lagrangian, and then you get a boundary term. You vary that boundary term with respect to the fields. So this omega depends on two variations of your fields. And in fact, the counter term sorry, brings um, a boundary contribution to um, the symplectic structure. So that's the prescription I work out with, with Don Marolf. Uh, and these two do not contribute, but the, the fact that you have derivatives here in this um, uh, Einstein term uh, make that it contributes. So this is the total symplectic structure. And if you look at the um, or, or orthogonal component of it uh, at the boundary, you will see that it depends on your free fields. So the search and tensor and GB. Uh, so it takes that form. And if you specialize to this boundary gauge where you fix uh, the boundary gauge like I, I prescribed before, and you use these um, uh, variables for describing the component of the stress tensor, uh, so here you don't vary GTT and GTA, you just vary the GB. So you get AB here, the, the big A, big A, big B. But then the, the boundary metric is not uh, changing. So the, you take out the trace part. So you get just delta J, uh, delta Q. So you see that there is, um, there is a flux in general leaking out of your boundary. Um, so uh, in the sitter it's very natural. Uh, in ADS it's not standard. So in ADS, uh, what you usually fix for ADS CFT is that you fix your boundary metric. And then you have a CFT and then you have a, you know, flux leaking out. You have a closed system, like a unitary system. So here, since um, uh, if you don't impose that boundary condition, if you just keep it everything general, then you have ADS coupled to an external system. And that coupling is described by this symplectic structure. Uh, in the sitter, it's very natural to keep it. In, in ADS, uh, the, you know, the CFT interpretation has not been really worked out in that case. That's usually in ADS CFT, you just fix QAB to be zero. Uh, sorry, Jeffrey, in, in the symplectic structure you wrote down, there is no relation between QAB and JAB, right? And like the, no, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no relation at all. So uh, in fact, uh, in fat space, you know, uh, you are familiar that you have the, sh the news, the bonding use, which then right. cause the non-trivial aspects of what is leaking out of your uh, space time. And in right. ADS, so, or the sitter, I would argue that there are two fields, the independent fields of UAB, which are both like a couple that form like the analog of the bonding use in, in the sitter or ADS. And it's this, these two fields, GAB and QAB. And there are two, two of them are totally independent. Uh -huh. And you see both of them, uh, the fact that if you have any of the two, uh, you know, at the same time they, they, they uh -huh. turn on, there will, they will be a flux. So it's a bit different. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, but, but this is, 
uh, this is not unitary though in some sense that there is some uh, yeah so now if you want um, yeah exactly so this is why in the sitter you know you always have non unitary t uh, because you have things coming out of the boundary but there is a way to also think about it in the ADS uh, if you insist that ADS should be um, your unitary theory in ADS then you should fix either QAB to be zero or JAB to be zero Mm -hmm. QAB to be zero in ADS is the standard boundary condition, and then the, the group that preserves that is uh, SO3, um, uh, let me just, um, I think I have a slide on it, so let me just skip this, yeah, um, well, I didn't write it down explicitly, um, but uh, yeah, so you get back to your standard assemblage symmetry, so SO3, uh, two. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, if I fix JB to be zero, I just want to mention this. I have my slide, uh, yeah, yeah, here. Huh? So it's a new set of boundary conditions. So deformation of ADS CFT, if you want. Um, well, the holographic interpretation, I, I, I don't have it uh, yet, but um, it's, it, it should be some form of deformation of, uh, of ADS CFT. But just to mention that it has an interesting symmetry group. So the, the symmetries, you still have the, vet, the, the time component. Um, which is there, and and then all the algebra, uh, the area preserving diffeomorphisms, and uh, there is a Dirac bracket with a central extension that is realized. Everything is unitary. Everything is all the charges are conserved, finite. Uh, so it's an alternative boundary condition for ADS that exists in uh, in ADS four, and I believe in any any dimension. So, but that's when you really want to um, impose that you have no flux. But then you you don't have lambda BMS anymore. You you just uh, have a subgroup of it. Is that is that clear? Yeah yeah thanks thanks. Okay, uh, let me skip this because I have no time. Um, so let me go to the surface charges. Um, so now um, the, the the standard relation in covariance phase space when you have uh, a symplectic structure. And you have a generators of asymptotic symmetries is that you contract one of these two variations with the generator of the asymptotic symmetry and then this asymptotic structure becomes a boundary term a boundary form so and then you isolate the boundary term form you integrate it over a sphere and that gives you uh, the variation of your hamiltonian so you can do that uh, here and you get uh, you get that expression which is a standard expression that you you, you probably know if you know um, holographic normalization uh, so the charges are finite because of the randomization of the symplectic structure uh, and they're not conserved not nor integrable which is expected because you have flux leaking out of your boundary uh, in general i know that if you um if you fix the boundary metric all this flux this, this non-trivial piece here that i called um, uh, how do you call that one chi uh, chi uh, is it becomes zero in the standard ads cft so here is non-zero and that part, I will call it delta, it's a total variation, so it's delta of H, I will call it uh, the Hamiltonian. So, um, but Hello? still, yes. Sorry, uh, so, you know, like, um, do you actually have solutions with this uh, leakage turned on, like, uh, let's say, asymptotically? Uh, do you have some rather... Solution? Ah, solution with, uh, with this G uh, turned on? Uh, yeah, where the symplectic uh, leakage is there. You know, ah. uh, well, I mean, um, uh, you mean explicit solutions? I mean, obviously, any, any solution, I mean, asymptotically, uh, you can just plug any solution you like because you, you, you can just plug any solution of the, um, it's, it's arbitrary metric and, and then uh, um, an arbitrary conserved stress energy tensor respect to the metric. Uh, there, are, there are examples uh, derived um, recently by uh, Gary Horowitz. And uh, I don't remember if it was with uh, Oscar Diaz, I think, uh, because they were looking at various black hole funnels, uh, and then they were these funnels were non-trivial, and so they had non-trivial boundary metric. So if you have perturbations, then they have to allow some kind of other type of boundary condition, like infinity, and the standard but, one. But, so but I think but, these are examples. But we understand this, right? That you know, like uh, the cluster solution that you're thinking about uh, is bigger than the, the Pfefferman Graham. Uh, expansion solutions? No, 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 it's not bigger than Pfeffer and Gram. It's just Pfeffer and Gram, except that usually in Pfeffer and Gram, one fixes the boundary metric. Right. So here I just take Pfeffer and Gram without uh, fixing the boundary metric. I just fix the determinant of the two sphere of that boundary metric. And I, uh, 
So there are still two degrees of freedom left in four dimensions. Okay. But, uh, but, but the standard expressions for the Pfefferman Graham still hold? Yes, yes, it's still Pfefferman Graham. Okay, thanks. Yes. I have a question. Uh, can I ask? Yes, it? yes sure. Uh, what is this uh, bracket that you have written actually? Uh, ah, yeah, let me come to this. Yeah, yeah. okay, good. So, um, so there is still a, a representation theorem. Uh, and this is the typical representation theorem when you have flux leaking out, when you have this kind of structure of non-integrable charges. Uh, so the, the first bracket of the vectors, um, it's a Lie bracket, the standard Lie bracket of vector fields, with a correction, because these vectors are actually depending on your fields. So you have to also act uh, uh, on the vector, on the fields hidden inside of the vector. And this action is just, you replace every, uh, it's like, it acts like a, a differential uh, operator. And each time you have um, a field, you replace it with a Lie derivative with respect to the field. So it's a linear differential operator, this one. Yes. Um, okay. And then the, this bracket, this Dirac bracket, is actually the action on the, the, this part of the Hamiltonian part, plus uh, this non-integrable part contracted with the, the action, the variation of the fields. Okay. So, so that's the essential. Because then, essential uh, to have Dirac brackets here. Yes. You, you need to yes. do this in a fixed gauge, right? Otherwise, yes. it doesn't make sense. Yes. So here, everything is uh, obtained in this uh, particular Pfeffer gram bond gauge. Yes. And this is the right yes. definition in that context. Okay. That's the one that represents the algebra. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, yes? I have a question. So actually, it will help uh, with Loba's question also if you can uh, go over the slide that you skipped about the cut solution, why the cut solution is not part of your quantification. Ah. ah, OK, yeah, good. So OK, so let me go back here then. So here, uh, I'm talking about the, um, so uh, so far, I discussed arbitrary boundary conditions. You know, I mean, I, I kept everything general. I never constrained anything except putting gauge, fixing the gauges. Huh? So here. Uh, for for this, now, if I impose the boundary condition in the ADS, I will just really really constrain uh, the, the the setup. So in this case, I, I fix J B to be zero. So J B equals zero is something that, like I fix part of the stress energy tensor. So it's not a standard boundary condition. In terms of CFT, it means I constrain a lot of the CFT. I constrain the stress energy tensor of the CFT. But I leave the CFT living on the boundary sphere, on the boundary metric with the sphere that is varying. So with that, in that case, uh, it's an interesting subset of boundary condition. And then the Churchill is part of the boundary conditions, but not Kerr. Because the, if you compute the stress energy tensor of Kerr, it was done in actually by a paper of Howard and Johnson, and then also um, by, by all these people at the same time. Uh, and it takes the form of a perfect fluid at the boundary uh, with some boost uh, related to the, the angular momentum of Kerr. So it's an interesting uh, expression for the stress energy tensor. Um, of, uh, of Kerr. But if you look at uh, then the, the, the traceless components, which is JB, it's non zero. Because we basically, because we have a tree here, so it doesn't, doesn't work. So uh, it's interesting to note that there is another uh, stationary solution, actually, it's unique, which obeys the JB equals zero and is given by that stress energy tensor. Um, uh, and, and, and I don't know if that solution is regular in the interior, because all I know is this Pfeffer and Gram expansion is that stress energy tensor for a given boundary metric, which is flat. Um, but I don't know if it's uh, singular or regular in the interior. But since there is no uh, uniqueness theorem in ADS for uh, black holes, maybe it is another black hole, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, sorry, I got a little confused. Uh, in the solution you've written here, the TAB has a non-zero JAB, but I thought uh, you allowed for non-zero JAB, right? So, so why don't? Uh, uh, so this TAB has non uh, as a zero JAB. That's just a trace. Uh, no, yeah. no, the one, the one on top. These. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's not. Yeah, yeah. So, so not Kerr. So, so this is not a solution. So Kerr is not the solution of the boundary condition JAB equals zero. Uh -huh, uh -huh, okay. So, yeah. So JAB. So, so Kerr, Kerr is not a solution of this boundary condition of this. Uh, new boundary condition is is another stationary solution, which is solution of that boundary condition. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. But okay, I don't know if it's regular. Um, okay, uh, so let me um, go back now. For so now, I don't consider this boundary condition. I just look at QAB arbitrary. Yeah, so I look at the lambda BMS group and okay. Let me let me discuss a bit the flat 
flat uh, limit now. So if you take the standard, uh, you know, holographic uh, action, uh, the standard sample structure that we use from it, uh, and then uh, you try to take the flat limit. So the flat limit already exists. We saw it for the for the vectors, for the the symmetries. It exists for the phase space, for the, the set of solutions. It exists. Uh, so we expect that it should weigh, it should work out also for the for the sample structure, but it does not. There is a there is a divergence. If you take this, this just just this explicit expression, there is a world of a lambda here. But now, if you look at it more closely, uh, this one of a lambda, which is, I'm not going to discuss the other terms, um, it's a total derivative. So there is a du. So in fact, we can cure it. And we 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 we, show it, we could do it using a corner term in the action. So so far, I did not add any corner terms in the action. Uh, and a corner term is something of this form. So it's a term that is a total derivative, like a d of something, which is a corner action. Uh, and so this corner action, I co-dimension two uh, objects. Um, so if you, if I take a corner action and I vary it, it will have only total derivatives in it. So there will be a part which will contain the, like if you want the, the corner equation of motion, and then another part which will be the, the corner boundary here. So, and that's, if I use that, I can build a symplectic structure, a corner symplectic structure. So now the, the prescription that I, I argue following the, the addition of this, uh, this action, I, I would argue that you need to modify the symplectic structure in the following way. You have to add a boundary contribution to your sampling structure using also this corner term here. So if you admit this prescription, then uh, we can solve this, uh, this problem by adding a, a boundary counter term. So these counter terms are here, huh? are the boundary of the sitter or the boundary of ADS, but they change your dynamics uh, everywhere because it's a boundary term that acts at any value of u. So it's not somehow, so it's a bit funny the way it works. Um, so the, this diverge, this this contra term is as an explicit form. So here's the form. Actually, it's a kinetic term for the boundary metric. So you see, it's a it's a very nice form at, at the end. It's a it's a kinetic term for the boundary metric, and this is more a more fancy way to write it. If you want to write it geometrically, you can you can do it. So you introduce a foliation, and then a projector along the foliation, and then you you can write it in a geometric way if you if you want to. So with that uh, prescription, then uh, Sorry, yes. What difference do these this counter terms obey all the symmetries? What difference? Uh, what symmetry do they break? Uh, is there uh, some uh, like what do they do? Like symmetry. Uh, so they uh, so that term. I mean, this it um, it's it's a, it's a covariant. Uh, is so it's it's um, it's totally. Uh, you see. It depends only on the on the, on G zero, which is which transforms uh, under very well on the diffeomorphisms on the sphere, and then uh, the T is this foliation that is fixed. So T is totally fixed uh, because uh, of the lambda BMS group is exactly uh, done so that it preserves that foliation, uh, and then you have also the um, uh, the Q square root of the determinant here, L is just a scale, uh, which is also fixed. So in fact, this is preserved by the lambda BMS group for that reason. So it's, it's invariant, it's, it's, it's generally a covariant respect to the lambda BMS group. Okay. So it does not break anything. But, but it changes the asymptotic charges? The yes. Uh, well, it, actually it changes, uh, it adds um, exactly only one term, which, is, which will kill this one. Okay. So it just changes, it changes them, it changes. Uh, so from, from the asymptotic charges, we see also divergence in the charges. Uh, but then this term kills the divergence here and also in the charges. So it's a form of uh, renormalization that is specific to this lambda BMS group. Uh, it, and it's a corner term. So if, if I don't take the lambda going to zero limit, but uh, if, so I can, can I still add these terms in the, in the ADS itself and, and define yes. ADS charges? Uh, yes, yes. But this term, uh, you see, you, um, you, it does not transform nicely under all the diff S3 group. Uh, so you will have, you can do it, but you have first to boundary gauge fix like the way I, uh, I prescribed to be able to define this T foliation and the square root of the determinant. Then that, that term makes sense. Uh, otherwise it's not uh, covariant to respect that term. But modulo that, if you fix a boundary foliation and the boundary measure, 
uh, in ADS, you can just add it in ADS and not take any flat limit, of course. So. Okay, and, 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 and how will it change the standard charges? Let's say, you know, like... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, but that's my question. That's, that's the point here. Let me uh, come to this. Uh, this is the next slide, actually. Uh, so this is now, okay, there was a smooth limit, but uh, here is the, the, your, the answer to your question. So uh, there is a boundary term to the sampling structure in addition to this, the renormalized sampling structure. So now if I look at the charge, they still obey the same equation. So, you know, uh, you have to work out what is the extra contribution from here. Uh, but in fact, since this is already a boundary term, it will just add to the charge exactly the, the corner charge, the corner sampling structure contracted with the lead derivative of your fields, you see? Because it's already a D of something. If I, if I look at what is the K, it says that D of K is omega, or it's just adding omega. So that's how it changes the charges with that term. Okay, thanks. And then you see, if you work out the algebra, the Dirac bracket, uh, you will see that actually you will have a central extension now. So before there was no central extension for, um, without this, this extra corner, corner contribution, and now there is a central extension. So this is a corner extension related to this. Geoffrey, sorry, hi. Uh, can I ask a question? This is uh, Ioannis. Yes, hi, Ioannis. Hi. Uh, so, um, do you have a way of getting the same renormalized presymplectic form directly, like I mean, from flat space? So, including the corner terms? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, in f actually, uh, at originally, we were working only in flat space, and we had, uh, we had, um, so this, we had this divergence, and we had to fix it. So, you, we use the higher wall ambiguity to fix to add a boundary term to omega, uh, and to, which, is, which is a way to fix that here. Huh? I'm fixing the higher wall ambiguity. So, we had, uh, we, it was exactly the same divergence, and we said that there should be a a, a boundary structure that should compensate this, uh, but it, we did not have a, a covariant formulation of it, or uh, it did not come from the action. Um, in, so we just did it in flat space, and we, uh, at the end, it exactly agrees with the flat limit of that one. So in flat space, you only get you only get this divergence here if you do it yes. in flat space without any other. I see. Yes. So we, we just had this one and we, we, we prescribed the, how to fix the one ambiguity to remove that divergence in flat space. Mm -hmm. And now we have better because we have a, a justification of how it comes out from an action, from this corner term action uh, and following this prescription that I, I wrote here. And so, and this is a, a new prescription. Uh, so because it's, it's, a, it's a corner term type prescription. Uh, and you see the, the way it has to work uh, is to define first this omega c from this uh, variation and use it for for printing boundary. And that's the, the way the way it works out. So there's no proof that it would work out in general, but it, here is that it seems to be the right prescription. Sorry, sorry. I, I also have a question. Actually, it's related to a logar's question. Uh, okay. The question is uh, that uh, the subjective form here always seems to have a delta q a b. Uh, but there should be something interesting happening even when you do ads CST with normalizable boundary conditions. So you don't have a delta QAB at all. I mean, so shouldn't there be a sense in which at least the conformal group is recovered without having any delta QAB? If I just yeah, yeah. So, okay, let, let, yeah, yeah, yeah. so let me go back here. So when QAB is fixed, uh, this amplitude flux is zero at the boundary. Uh, and then the, the, the um, well, this is, or, yeah, this is the other component actually, it's the row component, but there is no flux indeed. So the, 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 the lambda BMS group is, is, is reduced to, to the standard SO3,2 group. Uh, and the, all the charges are finite, all the sampling structure is finite, everything is finite. There's no, uh, just using the, the standard counter terms. So there's no need for this construction. The, 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 new, the new point here comes just because QAB is varying now. Uh, that I understand, but I'm, uh, what I'm trying to understand is how from here, in the limit when delta QAB goes to zero, you recover the standard structure. Uh, that's what I have not understood. Ah, okay. So this, this term, uh, when Q, delta QAB is zero, uh, all this term vanishes, actually. So uh, but shouldn't there be some, some, some non-trivial commutators corresponding to the conformal algebra, the standard uh, conformal algebra of ADS-CFT, which we should be able to recover in that limit? Uh, yeah, I mean, you should recover everything in the limit. So if I take uh, this one, uh, so now uh, if, I, if, if I now say QB does not vary, you see all this term will go to zero and you will go back to the standard bracket and the, the lambda BMS reduces to the conformal group and you, you go back to the standard uh, Dirac bracket of the SO3,2. 
I see. Okay. So identically, see. You, you have no subtlety. So all this goes identically zero, and you go back to this bracket becomes the standard bracket because this uh, this theta psi goes to zero as well, and you get back the standard Dirac bracket. So two three comma. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Three a generalization. Yeah. Good. Uh, so I'm sorry. I'm 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 getting a bit over time. Um, how much time do I have? Um, uh, Actually, I mean, uh, how much how much time do you need? You think? Uh, maybe in five minutes. Uh, uh, yeah, I, mean, I I think we can take some more time than that. It's fine. I mean, we usually do go a bit over time. It's, it's okay. yeah. If it's uh yeah yeah, I can. I, I'm I'm nearly done. Huh? I, I just need maybe uh to say give one more more point on the flat limit. Okay. I would rather that you uh spend some time rather than than rush. So. so it's okay. 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 So um, so now just about the flat limit. Um, so uh, now with that divergence removed, uh, all the rest, the finite expression, uh, well, you can work it out, and then you get these, these kind of expressions in the, for the flat, flat limit. So you get also, also a Hamiltonian uh, and then a non-trivial, uh, non-interrogable part here. And you can work out the, the, the Dirac bracket with the definition I gave earlier, and it reproduces the, the, the algebra with a central extension or non-trivial co-cycle, I should say, um, which has this form. Uh, so that term was well known since the work of Barney Schussar. Now this work, this one is extra because uh, they looked at the Viras rows and the Viras rows, you don't see the, 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 the richie of the boundary is actually zero except at the points where the meromorphic poles are and they didn't look at the meromorphic poles. So, but in general, you, for this phase two, you have, you have that term as well. Uh, so these terms, uh, you can actually, you can see that term very well uh, if you do the, um, double soft limits of soft gravitons and you look at the commutator of the double soft limits then um, you will see that term happening uh, there's a very nice, very nice paper on, on this um, and, uh, by um, well, i forgot by whom um, but yeah uh, so that term has been saying that term uh, is you can see is non-trivial it's a non-trivial co-cycle as well that appears for the for the super Lorentz. So you will see it for normally for the commutator of, of the two uh, soft limits in if for the subleading uh, graviton theorem. But that, that, that thing has not been done. Um, okay. Uh, so then the last point I wanted to to, to give is um, is is the the, the fluxes. Um, so so far I discussed the surface charges, which are co-dimension two. Um, so uh, you can work out as well the fluxes in the sense of you know the difference between the future and the past, which is the entire uh, integrated flux of, of these surface charges. Um, and to discuss that, it's important to know what is the boundary condition uh, close to these boundaries in flat space. Uh, there's been a lot of question uh, discussion about the, these boundary conditions because the one of the standard literature did not allow the super Lorentz uh, transformations. Uh, but at the end, uh, when dust settles, I think uh, we have the, the, the most general boundary conditions admitting uh, super Lorentz uh, transformations. Um, so, and to obtain this boundary condition, the easiest way, one, the easiest way to do is to, to work with Minkowski in arbitrary super Lorentz and super transition frame. So you, you actually um, find, you have to find the, the, the diffeomorphism that exponentiates these uh, infinitesimal generators, act on Minkowski and get the result. Uh, and then from that result, uh, you know to what you should asymptote. Um, so this is the result after you exponentiate these uh, generators. You get a closed form formula for what is Minkowski in these weird coordinates. Uh, and that, uh, it has this kind of structure. So you, it has a non-trivial boundary metric, which is related with some diffeomorphism and some uh, overall vital vi of uh, vi scaling. And then from it, you can build uh, R. And from it, you can build some kind of Liouville a stress energy tensor. Uh, and that's like the vacuum value of the bonding use. It's a Liouville stress energy tensor of this field uh, that I call the super boost field. So it's generated with super boost. So now the this now if you have a general space time that admits uh, gravitational radiation and uh, you know fluctuations, you want to asymptote to this kind of vacuum. So you want the shear to asymptote this one plus some correction. You want the news to asymptote that, that news plus a small correction. Uh, so now, now let's impose these boundary conditions. 
Uh, and there is another subtlety that the way you separate the, the we call the Hamiltonian between the, 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 the integrable and non-integrable part, let me just go back here. Uh, so you can always add a delta H here uh, and put a minus delta H in, in, uh, in Xi. And it will not change your infinitesimal surface charge. It will just change what you mean by Xi and H. And actually this is always true. It's just a, a, a redefinition of what you call one and the other. But there is a very nice definition. So there is a very nice delta H. Uh, so uh, if I write the standard Dirac bracket, and not the, the, the more complicated one that I wrote earlier, just the standard Dirac bracket, you can make some rewriting. I mean, it's a bit technical. And then let me just say that you can, you, can, you can do it. And then you define the shift, which is a specific prescription. Then you obtain this. So you obtain uh, that for the flat uh, case, for the flat uh, charge, it actually uh, it has a very nice form because all the BMS charges are identically zero for Minkowski in an arbitrary BMS frame. So, the, so if you want a quantum interpretation of this, it's like if you do, uh, you, you dress your charges with all these soft modes, you dress them and you, so that your, the overall normalization of your charge is zero for all the vacua. Um, and then with that prescription, uh, the standard Dirac bracket is without central extension. Uh, at the corners, at, the, at, at the, the place where you have Minkowski. So it implies that you have, uh, in terms of fluxes, your flux algebra, because it's just the difference of the corners here, is just realized with a central extension. So, and in fact, it was just obtained at the same time, just uh, some months earlier by Campilia and Perazza uh, with different methods, that you can realize the BMS uh, super translations and super Lorentz uh, transformations in terms of fluxes without central extension. And it just corresponds to fixing a specific prescription for the shifts and uh, having the, the right boundary conditions for your, your fields. Okay. So let me conclude. Uh, so the flat BMS group admits uh, so an extension to ADS, which is lambda BMS uh, group of it. So it's a group of uh, open ADS based on, I call them open because there is a flux leaking um, out of them. Uh, I discussed the surface charges, uh, these alternative boundary conditions in ADS4, uh, and then I discussed all of these corner terms in, in details. Huh? So, so I will stop here, and if you have more questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer them. Okay, thank, thanks a lot, Jeffrey, for that uh, wonderful talk. Uh, maybe we can all unmute ourselves and uh, clap. Uh, Uh, if anybody has questions, please go ahead. Uh, so, so Jeffrey, I have a question. Yes. Uh, the question is that that even uh, even without uh, taking uh, delta, even even while fixing QAB to be the boundary metric, uh, there is a sense in which at least perturbatively you can take a flat space limit of ADS, and that you know if you're given some correlation function, you can take a limit and get a flat space S matrix. And then you know there might be some sense in which there are soft uh, theorems for that and so on. So, uh, uh, is there, are you, I mean, uh, are you suggesting that uh, there should be no good flat space limit if you keep the standard boundary condition? Or, uh, uh, um, or I'm just trying to understand how this would match with the uh, with other ways of taking the flat space limit of ADS, where you don't modify the boundary condition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so the so in flat space. Um, in flat space, you would like your boundary metric to be uh, independent of u, and to just uh, and to be basically the sphere. It can be a squash sphere because of the of the this large diffeomorphism. Um, so the natural uh, setup for looking at flat space is still to fix um, in the flat space limit is still to fix the boundary metric, um, except this uh, large diffeomorphisms. Um, so I would still say that uh, yeah, the um, uh, the natural setup. Uh, for for just the flat um, the flat limit would be to, to look at the QAB which is um, which which is not u dependent um, because that's, that's that's because it's not u dependent in general in a, for the standard boundary condition of flat space like the one uh, uh, no but I, I wanted to just fix the QAB uh, completely I mean I you know because that's what you do in standard ADACFD. And even there, we have some way at least of looking at perturbative safety correlators and taking flat space limits to get S matrix elements. 
So how does that uh, fit into this uh, this picture? Yeah, yeah. So the yeah definitely fits. So the the so here so you you don't need the so then it will it will this lambda BMS will will not will 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 not be there. Um, so the here the the idea of this lambda BMS is that it allows to have the action of the super uh, well the generalization of the super Lorentz uh, transformations. Um, so. So I don't think for your purpose of uh, looking at the flat spacing of, of, of uh, correlations functions, it, it, it would be interesting. You could just use the standard uh, CFT. Uh, here, I think it would be inter more interesting if you have want to keep track of the conservation laws of um, um, of, of, of fluxes of stress energy tensor if in between this uh, this ADS and some axial region, and somehow. Um, it's, it's a way also in ADS to do to, to do that. Uh, it's, it, it mimics a bit what's happening in flat space because you know a big problem of flat space is that it has flux leaking out of the sky, and we are not very familiar with that in ADS. Um, but using this open boundary condition in ADS, it allows also to have uh, fluxes coming out of ADS, and maybe it's a it's a useful setup uh, to think about for thinking of leaking boundaries where you have to 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 to, to deal with. Um, with that, uh, sorry, sorry, but I'm confused about how that can be the the whole answer because uh, in, in, when we take these CFT correlators, we get some flat space S matrix elements, and there is a soft theorem for those S matrix elements. Uh, so there must be some sense, even with the QAB fixed boundary condition, uh, that BMS emerges in some limit because if you believe there's a limit between the you know soft theorems and super translations, there should be some sense in which uh, it should be important even for that. Yeah. So yeah, but I, I see your question. So I think so you you can always derive you know once you have the soft theorems, you you can try to promote them as as wild identities of some symmetry. So and I, I think this is where where this 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 group uh, becomes in, important. Uh, it's when you want to not only writing them because you can probably write them with, before without that, but if you want to promote it as being a, like coming from a symmetry principle like a wild identity, then you need you need to consider this. You see, so it's it's like if you want to um, to say that it comes from um, some neutral currents and then um, uh, and then derive its form from the from the symmetries from from the neutral currents, but it, it, you can probably derive you can derive it other in other way like um, directly from from looking at soft properties of the of the amplitudes. Uh, and then you, you can derive it without thinking about symmetries. I don't know if that answers. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Um, Rafi, I have one question. Yes. Um, uh, I wonder if in linearized gravity can one construct some solutions which uh, sort of enlighten your boundary conditions more? Is it? Do you think it's possible? Ah. Yes. Uh, yes. Certainly. Uh, because um, because the boundary condition is uh, is defined really from some asymptotic conditions, uh, so if you do, do linearized perturbation, you, you should be able to, to to derive what how to impose the boundary condition at at, uh, at, at infinity. Yeah, so it's, it should be possible. What I really would like to know is, is if this black hole, if, if this uh, stationary solution is really a black hole in ADS. Uh, but uh, you, you no, I, well, I, I I meant some. What I had in mind was some gravitational waves, kind of linearized gravitational wave solutions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be interesting to to see. Yeah, because uh, you know, once you have linearized gravitational wave, you always have to say to give a boundary condition if they are reflecting or, or not. But so it's that they, they, yeah, they sh there should be a way to to do it. Uh, hi, yeah, Pri. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so, uh, does this kind of construction can be made in the near near uh, the horizon of a black hole in ADS where and the asymptotic structure of near horizon metric can be preserved, and uh, you can uh, recover this lambda BS, BMS type of thing. Yeah. Um, um, well, if, if you have a if you have a brain that has a, a near uh, ADS four factor, then uh, definitely uh, um, you can certainly find this lambda BMS four. Um, 
So the analog in, in three dimensions uh, is the boundary metric. It's just um, totally um, you can you can you can gauge fix it, um, and then you have nothing left if you fix the boundary metric in three dimensions. This lambda BMS actually reduces to the standard two copies of the ref row. So uh, in three dimensions. There's no no uh, nothing new. It's just uh, it reduces to the virus more virus more. So the, the only new things is really four dimensions and higher. I mean, I guess everything will be fine in higher dimension as well. Um, so yeah, so if you have a brain system, we will get some KDS four, and uh, you should be able to find this. I would I would say it, this book might be interesting if you have like a, a black hole that is allowed to interact with the exterior, because then you have flux. You know, your naturally your black hole uh, topple to the exterior. System. Ah, okay, thanks. Sorry, Alok, did you have a question? Yeah, I, uh, so, uh, this is about the lambda BMS uh, that you defined, um, which, uh, in the flat space limit reduced to the uh, extended BMS uh, uh, with diffeomorphisms. But is there a, is there a possibility of uh, defining lambda there, BMS? There, there, I'm sorry, there is, a, there is a lot of noise. I cannot hear you. This maybe, maybe we can, uh, yeah. Could you repeat? Yeah, yeah. I, I was saying that suppose, suppose we just look at BMS in flat space, not the extension of BMS, yes. uh, which is only super translation. So uh, maybe I misunderstood, but in ADS uh, is a statement that there is no extension which will only produce BMS in the flat space when you take the flat space limit, uh, which will only produce super translations uh, um, because you really needed to relax your. Uh, met sphere uh, metric something. so you mean uh, can can yeah can i can i find just the super transitions and not yeah. the defense too yeah. Uh, yeah in fact in fact the answer is no because uh be, be simply because already the symmetry group uh of of uh, ads is so three comma two and there is no uh commuting sub subgroup um, uh -huh. so the structure constant already are non non abelian just for the exact symmetries uh so so they are coupled to each other I see, but but the, but you can still define super translation charges in um, in lambda BMS um, in your yeah, extension. Yeah, 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 you can define them, but they are not, they don't they are not commuting. Uh, not. And then, then the commuter the commutator of the two generates a super uh, Lorentz. Uh, so let me go back to the commutators because they they are, they are coupled to each other. Simply because already for the symmetries they are already coupled, so right. there's no hope to decouple them. So, so if you take a if you take something like a Schwarzschild dissipator, which has no radiation uh, leaking out at infinity, and then if you look at this uh, super translation charges, not the fluxes, but the charges across a cut of the boundary of this dissipator, then uh, I mean at two different points on the cut, these charges will be same, right? I mean, I, I guess if there is no radiation, then they will not change uh, the super translation charges uh, that you would define. So is that is that true that if you take just a non-radiating solution like Schwarzschild dissipator, then you don't, you don't get fluxes. I mean, the fluxes are zero. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. So yeah. that does happen in lambda BMS. Uh, does that does is that is that true with lambda BMS also? Uh, yeah. So for if you take uh, yes, that's right. Uh, yeah. So you see here, just to finish your question, yeah, you see that if you take two two Fs, you get a Y. So they are coupled to each other. You cannot disentangle them. Uh, and now, if you look at the the algebra, the charges, uh, I will answer that here. Yeah, right. So if you look at this algebra, the the this this part is the flux the flux part. Uh, so um, if you look at variations that are uh, around Schwarzschild or Kerr, um, they will not vary your boundary metric. Um, and CAB in in ADS is related to to QAB as well, actually. So so all this time will be zero. So the charge will be conserved. I mean, so there will be a finite charge difference between two different ADS for all the and all the actually all the lambda BMS will be zero for the just Schwarzschild Schwarzschild ADS or Kerr ADS. All the or even the super translation charge, everything will be zero. Yeah, yeah, everything will be zero except if you just act with the arbitrary diffeomorphism. Now, if you look at Kerr Kerr ADS uh, with in an arbitrary DFS two frame. An arbitrary, uh, well, arbitrary lambda BMS frame. Then all the charges will be non-zero. If you just uh, make a, a very large diffeomorphism, uh, so you don't write it in the standard coordinates, you write it in a funny coordinate system. Where and then all the, you can turn on all the charges. Thank.
So, sorry, I have one more uh, one more question. So there's this visitor memory um, uh, work by Wald et al. recently that they have they have tried to define the memory effect in visitor. Uh, Wald and, and his collaborator. So, do, do you think the super translation charges even there are related to this memory? I mean, has this been looked at at all? Uh, yeah. So this is an open question. Um, so this, yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, I would like to know the answer, but uh, I don't have an answer at the moment. Uh, we're we are thinking about it with uh, with Adrian Roma, but I, okay. I, I I I don't really know. Hi, I have a question. This is uh, Sucheta oh, from sure. Brussels. Hi. So I was thinking, can you interpret these lambda BMS transformations as some canonical transformations or a Hamiltonian flow because you have a non-integrable piece in the charges? Um, um, well, can you interpret this as uh, Hamiltonian flow just for flat space? Just if you have a, the, the, just the existing the mass in flat space, uh, yeah. it's just is the same. Uh, it's the same. Uh, already um, it's not different between uh, the standard definition of bonding mass in, in flat space so I, I don't know if you can have that implementation in flat space uh, no but even in uh, ads so uh, when one usually defines these uh, charges canonically i mean uh, we really have to ensure that the symplectic form is finite and integrable and so on in order to define canonical uh, generators right like uh, the the old work by Heno titled on. Yeah, I, uh, can you yeah. interpret it in that way? So um, yeah, I mean you, you can work everything in, in Hamiltonian language is it would be equivalent. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, in Hamiltonian even in Hamiltonian language it would be the same structure. So you always have an integral a non-integrable piece because your charges are not conserved because mm -hmm. you are fluctuating out. So you will never have uh, like integrable charges, like canonical generators, in the, in the sense of radiated and um, Yeah. Because uh, so the standard definition of asymptotic symmetries is that you have uh, you know exactly integrable charges, but mm -hmm. it's not it cannot be the case uh, for flat space at null infinity because you have flux looking out. So you need to generalize this definition. Yeah, so it's the same here. Okay. I see. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions for Jeffrey? I have one. I have one question. Sorry. Uh, uh, no, it, it's some problem that uh, you see. If you have, uh, you mentioned that the charges actually satisfy a Dirac algebra in the sense that you have fixed the gauge, and so the surface integrals actually know about the volume of the system, right? And they're not really surface charges. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of information about uh, what is happening in the bulk, uh, which is also contained in these charges. I just wanted to clarify this, actually, that you yes. cannot define this algebra without uh, gauge fixing, which therefore includes volume terms. Yeah, so here, uh, indeed, so to define all this, I needed two ingredients, which is the, I will go back to the, the beginning. Um, Oops, well, was it before? Yeah, so I need, I need indeed uh, to gauge fix to, 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 to define this boundary measure, a boundary volume, and uh, a foliation uh, to define this U. Right, uh, right. Uh, so, uh, but I think that you should always, so it's always possible to reach, to, to, uh, to reach such a boundary gauge. Yes, so I, I agree you, with that. Yes. So, so then you you have to if you are working with different gauge, um, well, it would be hard to well you have to work out the dictionary. I mean, it's like if you you know the natural uh, you know stress energy tensor of ADS is in the Fahrenheit gauge that you can find it in the metric. You, you always yes. there is a you always find the, the structure in a better gauge, right? Uh, in, so it's the same here. You find this uh, using this boundary foliation measures, and you have uh, some bond some natural structure that you can use. Um, so I'm not, yeah, so I'm not sure what's, what's your, exactly your question. If yeah, my, 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 my question was that uh, basically when you work with a fixed gauge and Dirac brackets, the surface integrals actually contain information about volume integrals. In ah. the 
And this is the old point of Raja and title going. Okay. So, yeah. uh, I mean, that's what I just wanted to make that comment and I yeah, ask yeah. you whether you agree with me or not. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a generalization of Raja and title bomb. Uh, okay. And it's a generalization in two ways. Uh, because Regi Tenzelbaum looked at, uh, so they are on shell. I mean, the yes. on shell, uh, the Hamilton or any charge is a boundary term. So here it's the same. So, you know, we are lo looking just at the surface charge part. Uh, so we, we forget somehow about the, the co dimension one part because it's on shell zero. Uh, and then uh, we generalize a bit Regi Tenzelbaum because the, the, the charges are not conserved. Right? They looked yes. mainly at special infinity where charges are conserved. So this yeah. is where most of the work uh, on these charges, uh, non-conserved, was done by, uh, you know, Barnish, Trussard, uh, for de defining these kind of quantities, uh, like uh, this defined, modified bracket and direct bracket. And at the end, it's always the same expressions that show up. So it's, um, there's no general theory, uh, such general theory, but it's, in practice, it's always the, uh, the these definitions are the, seem to be the correct ones for that case. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Hi, uh, uh, there's also some discussion about some modified BMS boundary conditions which have indicated for some achromatic duality kind of things, right? So, do you think that kind of thing applies for this lambda BMS? Um, uh, so, modified boundary conditions, could you be more precise? Which, um... uh, as in this uh, uh, Berg by Bunster pairs and so on. Uh, Ah, for the, ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I read that one. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember that paper though. Um, okay. The, the hourglass paper. I mean. Yeah, so here, uh, yeah, all this construction really rests on DFS2, so on the boundary condition by uh, Campiglia Lada. But um, I, I don't know if there is another construction that would be possible. Okay. So, Geoffrey, in the uh, sympathetically flat case, there is this conservation statement, right, which you discussed in the beginning, uh, that uh, scry minus, scry plus uh, charges yes. are conserved are equal, which you, you you get by looking at physics at spatial infinity. So, but is there any any statement like that in the EDS or DS case for these charges? Or is there... um, not, um, yeah. Uh, no, that I'm aware of, because uh, I mean, it's uh, you know, it's really in flat space. When you take the flat space limit, you can take it two ways. You know, you can take it like a huge, like future uh, with future type foliation or past time foliations, but and then in flat space, you have this antipodal map at infinity, a special infinity. Uh, he here, you only have one boundary in ADS or the sitter, uh, right. and there's no notion of special infinity or antipodal map uh, that I see. Yeah, indeed. Uh, it would be nice to know to understand what is special infinity in flat space uh, from ADS, but I don't know. Um, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, can you please go back to your previous slide? Uh, that ex extra boundary term when you add that, that cancel the divergence part. Uh, the the on the 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 diversions uh, being cancelled. This one. Yeah, yeah. The, the, this one. Yeah. So here, here the uh, extra boundary charge that you, that you added that cancel this divergence part. Yeah. So here, this is the this is the equation of motion, right? Uh, yeah, so yeah, so that's when you vary, you know, when you vary an action, you always have an equation. Yeah, you know, you always have like a, the equation of motion plus. So this inside is a du of something, but I keep yeah. the du inside of the definition of theta c. So and I put since it's a boundary term, this is a d here, and so the du remains here in front. So this, this is kind of, term, yeah. So this is kind of on shell, but here is uh, some flux. And we are adding some boundary terms to to cancel this diverging part, right? Yeah, yeah. So we are adding. Uh, so you know the IO world ambiguity is why the boundary term or exact delta exact terms. And this is a way to fix it, the 
the ambiguity. Um, and and, um, and this, uh, this Lagrangian depends, it's not really, it's called dimension two, I mean, but it's, it depends on both the angles of the sphere and you. So it's, it's, it's also three dimensional in a sense. Huh? It's, it has, contains, uh, it's a function of three variables. Okay. Uh, so it's a corner term, but depending on three variables. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Uh, at this point, maybe I'll, I'll stop the recording and uh, if people have more questions to ask and Jeffrey, you're, you're still okay with that, uh, you, can, you can have more informal discussions, but uh, I'll stop the recording at this point.